in our last tutorial, we introduced the concept of deleverage, motivations behind using deleverage. Uh, I reiterated some of the issues with using the volatility of past returns, particularly in the case of daily returns, and uh, essentially demonstrated why um, using just past returns is not sufficient, using just leverage to uh, assess the risk of a trading decision is not sufficient, as risk is also proportional to the volatility of the assets in question that are being traded. All of this motivated the need to engineer a metric that enabled us to compare the risk of a certain position to the risk assumed on a reference asset that we chose as the euro dollar and we define that calculation for deleverage as very simply the volatility of the asset normalized by the volatility of the reference asset. This in turn would enable us to compare the risk of a certain position to the risk of the reference asset, thereby enabling us, enabling us to say that, say for example, the deleverage of a certain position is X, then it is equivalent to taking a leveraged position of X on the leveraged uh, on the reference asset, that being the euro dollar. Let's now go into uh, the specifics of the actual calculation, starting with the reference asset to begin with. For the volatility of the euro dollar, we calculate this over a period of one year uh, for subsequent use in calculations. Now before we go into the calculation of the uh, volatility of the asset, we need to introduce um, a new concept here, the concept of positions. At Darwin X, we measure the risk of trading positions. And a position is very simply um, a composition of assets that are open at any point in time with a certain exposure to the market. And to demonstrate what that looks like, we're going to use some examples of trade sequences and decompose them into positions to better illustrate how this works. So let's imagine we have a trader that's taken a series of, we'll keep the sim example simple, we'll have two trades in this picture, trade one and trade two at this point. And this trade one was opened at time t0. Trade two was opened at time t1. Trade one was closed at time t2. And trade two was closed at time t3. In order for us to decompose this into positions, let's, let's just take some of the specifics here. The first trade was the euro yen. And it was 0 0.1 lots long. The second trade was the dollar yen and here the trader took 0 0.2 lots long. Right. So the first thing we need to do is decompose this into positions and define positions along the way using this chart here drawn in parallel to illustrate the effect of positions versus trade sequences. As mentioned earlier, each position is a composition of assets that are open in that moment in time. Should an asset mix change at any moment in time, the existing position is closed and a new position is formed if there are any further assets open in the next duration. To decompose the sequence of trades into positions, we would call this position 1, where only the euro yen is open. Let's call that position 1 prime. The second position, Let's call that 2 prime is composed of the euro yen and the dollar yen since the euro uh, the dollar yen trade has only just been opened but the euro yen trade is still open and the third position 3 prime is where the euro yen has been closed and only the dollar yen is open thereby decomposing the trade sequence of two trades into three positions each of these positions will follow the same timelines as the trade sequence above and from there on, we'll illustrate and demonstrate how to calculate the risk of each of these positions, the deleverage. Again, T0, T1, T2, and T3. Position 1 prime opened at T0, closed at T1. 2 prime opened at T1, closed at T2. 3 prime opened at T2, closed at T3. That is essentially how positions work in relation to trade sequences. In order for us to calculate the deleverage of each of these positions, 
we need to do the following. We first need to measure the duration of each of the positions under consideration. We'll call this D1 prime, standing for the duration of position 1 prime, D2 prime, and D3 prime. Those are the durations of each of these, the individual durations of each of these positions. In order to calculate um, the deleverage of the first position, we're going to simulate historically 28 periods, 28 intervals of exactly the same duration. 28 intervals with duration D1 prime, historically, uh, from the position at hand, and we're going to have an equity level at each of these simulations. So at time t0, we have equity 0, at time t1, we have equity 1, equity 2, equity 3. Let's imagine that our starting equity for this simulation is 10,000 euros. With these 28 intervals that correspond in duration to the duration of the position that we're measuring D leverage for, we will calculate the returns based on the asset composition of that position and simulate this over these 28 intervals. Each of these intervals corresponding to this duration will then hence give us a return for that interval. And we will have R0, R1, all the way through to R27. N minus 1, 28 interval returns, using which we will calculate the volatility of position 1 prime. Very simple. So that will allow us to get the volatility picture, which we will then use to calculate D leverage for position 1 prime. Let's call this D leverage 1 prime equals the volatility, the sigma of position 1 prime normalized by the sigma of the euro dollar sampled for that same duration from the, the annualized volatility that we've been calculating, that we showed the calculation for earlier on in the examples. This will give us the deleverage of position 1. We rinse and repeat going forwards in time into each of the positions that we'd like to calculate deleverage for. And in this case, our revised equity level will be used in order to calculate the deleverage of the next position and so on and so forth for every position in this sequence of positions. Here E1, for instance, if we started off at 10,000, let's imagine that the revised uh, equity over here was 9,800. We would take 28 intervals back in time, again, this time using the duration of this new position, D2 prime, 28 intervals back in time with that duration, D2 prime, calculating returns using new revised starting equity, E1, carrying it forward, calculating the returns of position, sigma 2 prime, normalizing it with the volatility of the euro dollar, sampled for that duration from the annualized volatility of the euro dollar. And that's it. This will essentially give us the deleverage for each position decomposed from the sequence of trades that were executed by the trader in this trading strategy or what have you. Keeping all of this in mind, uh, there are certain considerations to account for. Bear in mind that with 28 intervals, we carry the potential risk of underestimating or overestimating the risk assumed by a trader on any particular position. How? Um, we'll, we'll demonstrate that with an example, but due to these scenarios of overestimation or potential underestimation, we need to define D levels. We need to bind it within certain control parameter values that enable us to intervene in cases where we encounter these periods of overestimation or underestimation. And therefore, from the purpose, for the purposes of calculations, being more representative of actual risk assumed by the trader, we need to bind the leverage as mentioned within some control parameter values that demonstrate the representative minima and representative maxima as pertains to the leverage. Let's go through an example of 
how this will work out in practice, where we will need a minimum bound and a maximum bound. Uh, let's start with the case where, say we have a trader that is uh, always trading news releases. And for this particular news release, the trader is um, um, uh, monitoring the status of the dollar CAD. Some point over here, the news release takes place results in a massive spike on the, let's make that a bit more aggressive, massive spike on the US dollar CAD. The trader is waiting for an entry. The trader starts entering the market at this point and holds a position from this point onwards for this duration. Let's call that D. If we were to consider 28 intervals uh, historically from this position corresponding to the duration of that position, we would then be considering these skewed returns that came about as a result of the news release. And even though the trader opened, opened the position after the event had already passed, we would inadvertently or accidentally end up penalizing the trader by saying that the trader is assuming way too much leverage on deleverage on this position. To account for such scenarios where the deleverage calculated may be too high compared to what is, um, what is likely, we have an upper boundary that caps the deleverage to a more representative level of deleverage that the trader would have assumed given this scenario. And it is to control for such scenarios where um, volatility or news events or any such spikes result in a skewing of the deleverage calculation that may um, unintentionally penalize the trader uh, as a result of it. Same is the case for the minima. So for instance, in the case of a, when do we need a minimum control value? So say at some point in time, we have a trader that is holding on, or, at, or well, not holding, but monitoring a basket of assets that the trader wishes to take a composite position on. And at this point in time, for, for whatever length of time, this um, composition of assets had dem has demonstrated this sort of behavior, and the trader is looking to take a position on this somewhere over here and hold that position for this period of time. However, the flatlining sort of volatile behavior experienced here is not actually representative of this basket of assets because historically it's behaved in slightly more volatile fashion. In such cases, taking 28 intervals that correspond to the duration of this position, historically from the position, would lead to the inclusion of this period of volatility that is not actually representative of the uh, more realistic volatility profile of this basket of assets as experienced historically. Therefore, to account for such scenarios where we may underestimate the risk assumed by a trader um, in any given position, we have a minimum control value that enables us to set a floor for calculated deleverage. If it is below this floor, we cap it to the floor, thereby creating this um, set of boundaries for both minima and maxima. The objective behind setting these boundaries, these control parameter values, is to ensure that in cases of uh, excess deleverage calculations, we enforce more reasonable representative boundaries, um, be they in the extreme case of low, volata low volatility or higher volatility conditions. With this, hopefully, we've demonstrated um, what deleverage is, how, how deleverage is calculated how we control the value calculated given certain scenarios that we've demonstrated here as, as examples to show why we control the value the way we do. Uh, hopefully the, um, the subject of positions is clear as to why we calculate the risk of trading position as opposed to individual trades. And um, the normalizing factor being the euro dollar, how we go about calculating the volatility of each position, normalizing for the euro dollar, sampled for that duration from the euro dollar's annualized volatility. Bear in mind that all of this is necessary for the purpose of eventually assisting us in getting a more adequate representation of the true value at risk of a trading strategy down the line. In future tutorials, we'll be covering how to use deleverage in calculating uh, a more adequate number of figure for value at risk of a trading strategy. See you in the next tutorial.